Profile Football Theater. From the official archives of Pro Football's Hall of Fame, Canton, Ohio. You'll see the great players and teams that have made professional football America's most exciting sport. Right here in the Profile Football Theater. This is the spiral ramp of the $1 million National Pro Football Hall of Fame. Visitors who move up this ramp from the ground level to the rotunda see the faces of those men who led the National Football League. From the beginning, the first commissioner, Joe Carr, who predicted a bright future for professional football, and he was so right. He was succeeded by Carl Stork, former manager of the Dayton Triangles. Then came one of the great four horsemen, Elmer Layden. Burt Bell, who gave pro football the draft, the player benefit plan, the best of its kind, and of course he devoted his life to the game. And here is the present commissioner, Pete Rosell. A dramatic part of this entrance on the rotunda level is this 52-foot dome, stylized architecture, which of course suggests a football reaching to the sky. It's punctuated by beautiful stained glass. Last year, over four million fans watched men like this play professional football in person. Quite a contrast to the very first picture of the initial professional football game, Latrobe versus Jeanette. The man that wore these pants was the first player to be paid to play, John Brawlier. Ten dollars for Latrobe. Latrobe beating Jeanette six to nothing, and professional football was well on its way. Here in Canton, Ohio, the birthplace and the cradle of professional football, they're collecting pictures of teams and players. Here are just a few. This team showing the evolution of the football pants themselves. A newspaper story telling about the Canton Massillon feud, written so beautifully by the Dean of American Sports Writers, Grantland Rice. And this is the game itself in 1906 about which he wrote in Maslin, Ohio, before a standing room crowd. And here you see a few standing on a standing trolley car. Farther east in Pennsylvania, a team called the Philadelphia A's was forming. In the offseason, many baseball players joined that team, such men as Rube Waddell and Christy Matheson. The team was owned and coached by the gentleman wearing the derby, Connie Mack. Speaking of versatile athletes, there was one and only one who brought fame first to professional football, Jim Thorpe. We hear his voice now commenting on his greatest sports thrill. Well, it was back in Stockholm, Sweden, 1912, when the king of Sweden said to me, you, sir, the, you, sir are the greatest athlete in the world. I think that was my greatest thrill in all my athletic uh, activities. It's good to know that this immortal heard a king say it. This blanket, maroon in color on this hulking figure, is a blanket that Jim Thorpe carried with him wherever he played. It was found many years later in the trunk of an automobile to protect the tire jack and other automobile tools. This is Jim Thorpe's sweater. In the bottom, these Indian ribbons sewn in by an Indian lady to bring Mr. Thorpe good luck. He later gave the sweater to a tiny young lady. She used it as a bed for her prized pet, a dog. 1916, this was the type of football they used, flat in nature compared to the tapered one we use today. This leather helmet was worn by Newt Rockney when he played for Notre Dame and later with the Massillon Tigers. Here at the most complete Pro Football Hall of Fame, we see the most complete scrapbook ever kept by the most complete football player that ever lived, Pete Fats Henry. We see items beginning with his childhood through his high school and college days, including tickets, a diary of everything he did, right through his professional playing days, and yes, even reminders of his coaching years at his alma mater, Washington and Jefferson. This man, Pete Fats Henry, still holds the record for punting, 94 yards, and he once drop kicked a field goal, 50 yards. With the birth of a league, professional football stars were born. Let's look at a couple of them. The man that wore this white jersey with the 11 on it was once called by Pop Warner, the football player without a fault. Ernie Nevers, 
and his Duluth Eskimos in one season played 29 games. And this trunk was much traveled because 28 of those games were on the road. Nevers missed only 27 minutes of play, which I'm sure is a record for most television viewers. The Eskimos enjoyed using this white ball against the white jersey. Consequently, it was most difficult to find. Thus, it was outlawed in professional football a little bit later. And now, you see busting out of the Ohio State Stadium, the galloping ghost Red Grange, who five days after his final football game for Illinois against Ohio State, was lured to the Chicago Bears by George Hallis. And it was professional football's first explosion, the impetus that the game needed at that time. You know, Red Grange is still a Chicago Bear? That's right, he telecasts their games. And he'll do it again here in 1963. There's a very interested man here in Canton, Ohio today. He's the present commissioner of the National Football League, Pete Rosell. Pete? Hello, Chris. Uh, I know that Red Grange brought about a resurgence in interest in professional football, but for some reason, as I walk around the Hall of Fame here, I see that it had its ups and downs after that. Yes, I think this check would indicate <laughs> that, Chris. That's an unusual check, and I hope you can explain it. Uh, this check is a check made out to uh, George Hallis of the Chicago Bears for $2,500. It was paid him by the Philadelphia Eagles in repayment of a loan that George had made in 1938 uh, to help the Eagles finish the season. Uh, it was a tremendous amount of money then. It's still not a small sum. However, it's, uh, today would probably represent the bill for tape for a football team for one season. You know, speaking of appreciation, I'm sure that television viewers all over the country uh, would like to thank you because you've got a great deal to do of assuring them that the road games would be televised back to their area in the team that they were interested in. This standardizing the television plan, I think, Pete, is one of the many fine things you've done. Well, we've had a good television uh, program, of course, in the league for many years, and we're very happy that it is consolidated now and, uh, of course, pleased with the tremendous interest shown in it throughout the country. Now, you've seen the Hall of Fame from its start. Uh, there's still a lot left to be seen, which we'll be uh, looking at, but uh, they've done a tremendous job here. I, as I say, as commissioner, I'm supposed to be impressed, but I'm deeply impressed. <laughs> when I saw this and uh, saw what a warm, living place it is, uh, I certainly like to extend my uh, congratulations to Director Dick McCann and the trustees here in Canton for uh, making it such a, a very fine memorial to professional football. Pete, how about uh, joining all of us now on this tour of the Hall of Fame? Fine. It's in this area that the Hall of Fame honors the many championship teams and the championship players. Teams like the Providence Steamrollers, the Pottsville Maroons, the Chicago Bears, players like Chicago Bears' George Musso, and yes, Bronco Nagurski's huge shoe compared with that of teammate George McAfee. These shoes were worn by referee Red Frizzell as he covered the Bears' 73 to nothing defeat of the Washington Redskins. And with the wear and tear, you can see that he was all over the ballpark covering the play. The gilted shoes that you're looking at now were those worn by Sammy Baugh as he culminated 16 years as a professional. He wore them in his last game. He wore this famous burgundy jersey with the numerals 33. Although he was fragile looking, he has lasted longer than any player to date. Of the many electronic devices here in the Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, is this Selectro slide, which by pressing a series of buttons, you can see championship scoring plays one by one. Let's take a look at last year's championship game. By pressing the first button, we see number 31, Jim Taylor, the league's leading scorer and ground gainer, trying to pull away from number 76, Roosevelt Greer. Let's see if he does as we press the next button. Still, Mr. Taylor shows the power and the speed as Sam Huff comes into the act, too. Another button is pressed. And the LSU star has pulled away, turns on the speed, and with the press of another button, you can see that he's into the giant end zone for six more points for the Green Bay Packers, who won the championship. This spot in the Hall of Fame is reserved for the defending champions. The Green Bay Packers not only won the title last year, but the year before. So they have two in a row. This year, they'll try to do what no other team has done in the history of the National Football League, that of winning three championships in a row. And you know... They're liable to do it. This area of the Hall of Fame pays tribute to two games which have added a tremendous amount of prestige to the National Football League. First, the All-Star Game played annually at Soldier Field in Chicago. And then, following the regular season, the Pro Bowl Game played at the Coliseum in Los Angeles. 
The college all-stars each year meet the National Football League champions. Many of the players of the National Football League played as all-stars and then came back to play in that very same game as top professionals. Like number 60, Chuck Bednarik from the University of Pennsylvania, who later played in the game as a fine center and linebacker for the Philadelphia Eagles. Number 14, Otto Graham, won on an all-star team representing Northwestern, went on to win with the Cleveland Browns as a quarterback, and only in 1963, he coached the All-Stars to a victory over the Green Bay Packers. Number 38 is the actual uniform, college All-Star uniform, worn by Wayne Milner in the 1936 game. Number seven on the blue jersey is that of Dutch Clark, who starred in an All-Star game. And uh, moving in here on this dark helmet with the 22 on the front, this is the helmet worn by the great All-American from the University of Texas, Bobby Lane, who retired last year as a member of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Detroit Lion fans will long remember this Honolulu blue jersey with the big 22 on it because he led the Lions to championships in the NFL. And now the milestone men, the men whose careers were milestones in pro football's advance. 17 unanimous choices selected by 14 men, each representing a National Football League city. First, from the Chicago Bears, fullback and tackle, Bronco Nagurski. Also of the Bears, halfback, Red Grange. Quarterback with the Redskins, 16 years, Sammy Baugh. Pete Fats Henry, tackle, Canton, Akron, New York, Pottsville, Staten Island. The perfect football player, fullback Ernie Nevers. And Jim Thorpe, halfback. Canton, Oorang, Cleveland, Toledo, Rock Island, and New York. And now the other members of the National Pro Football Hall of Fame. Founder, first president, Joe Carr. Tackle and end, New York, Green Bay, and Pittsburgh, Cal Hubbard. Founder, player, and coach, beginning his 45th season, Chicago Bears, George Hallis. Quarterback, Portsmouth and Detroit, Dutch Clark. Founder, player, coach, Green Bay, Chicago, Washington, Curly Lambeau. Center for 15 years with the New York Giants, Mel Hine. Halfback with Milwaukee, Duluth, Pottsville, Green Bay and Pittsburgh, Johnny Blood. And Green Bay Packers, Don Hudson. Founder, coach, and commissioner, Burt Bell. Tim Mara provided pro football with the stage it needed, New York City. He left a many-towered self-made monument, including the greatest dynasty in all sports, the football giants, from father to sons. Founder, 32nd season, Washington Redskins, George Preston Marshall. Unfortunately ill, unable to be here. He gave pro football the world championship game. A brilliant showman and a man who opened up the game of pro football with rules to allow passing from anywhere behind the line and moving the ball in from the sidelines. Each year, there will be others, but none will deserve a place here more than those enshrined this year. We're in one of two motion picture theaters in the National Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, where visitors can see not only exciting plays and players of the past, present, but in the future, the exciting plays and the stars will be recorded. As Commissioner Pete Rosell said earlier, the people of Canton, Ohio can be very proud of the many efforts that they extended in making this Hall of Fame possible. And we must also salute the tireless efforts and the masterful guidance of a former journalist, former executive with the Washington Redskins, and now the director of the National Pro Football Hall of Fame. Here he is, Mr. Dick McCann. Congratulations, Dick. Well, thank you, Chris, but actually this uh, building is a tribute to the fans, not just of Canton, 
but the fans of the United States and all the former football players and uh, fellows like yourself who have made it possible. Uh, I have been privileged to work here with these people and uh, I think this is going to be a great and wonderful place, even better than it is today. Congratulations again for an extraordinary job, Dick McCann. Thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's look at some of those exciting plays performed by stars of the past and present. For whom this National Pro Football Hall of Fame stands so proudly here in Canton, Ohio. Here's Green Bay Packer great Don Hudson taking an Arnie Herber pass for a long game. Don's blazing speed made him hard to cover. This time, watch him take a long throw from Herber. Good for six points. This is Dutch Clark, the greatest drop kicker of all time. A look now at the Dutchman's technique in slow motion. He once booted a 50-yard field goal in this unique manner. Dutch led the Lions in the early 30s. Here he passes for a touchdown to Ray Morris. The big star of the New York Giants was linebacker Mel Hine. Mel intercepts a Sid Luckman throw and runs like a halfback for a touchdown. Mel never missed a tackle. Watch him move in to slow and halt Dutch Clark. Mel starred for 15 years as a center and a linebacker. Here's the fabulous Red Grange, the most fabled halfback of all time. From the Illinois campus to the Chicago Bears, Red rewrote the record books with runs like this. No one will ever forget the powerful smashes of number three for the Chicago Bears, Bronco Nagurski. The monsters of the midway, the Bears were called and Bronco was the toughest of them all, as he exhibits here. Slinging Sammy Baugh became the greatest forward passer of all time in 16 seasons with the Redskins. These are the famous hands that helped Sammy break all the records. Sammy could throw them all, long or short. Here he drops a perfect toss in the lap of Wayne Milner for a touchdown. On the run or while off balance, Sam always hit his man. In this case, Bob Seymour. Sammy always had some tricks up his sleeve. He fakes a field goal, then throws to Cliff Battles. Cliffs weaves his way through the baffled defense for a score. 